Okay, so now we're going to talk about the management of the septic patient in the emergency room. And it's probably best to start with a couple of definitions. The first one is for SIRS, which stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. And in order to meet the SIRS criteria, you have to have two of the four things. So a temperature that's greater than 38 or less than 36 degrees Celsius. And I'm not metric either, so that's 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. A heart rate greater than 90. So remember, our definition of tachycardia is greater than 100, so this is even less than that. A heart rate greater than 90. Or a respiratory rate that is uh, greater than 20. Remember, most people in the ER have a respiratory rate of 20, so it's not greater than or equal to, it's greater than 20. Uh, or, you know, a, P a PCO2 of less than 32. And then the only one that's a lab criteria are these, the white counts. White count greater than 12 or, or less than 4, so outside of the range of 4 to 12, or 10% bands. Now this really isn't too specific, because imagine you're working out at the gym and you're really getting a good workout. Chances are you're going to raise your temperature, you're going to raise your respiratory rate, you might even raise your uh, heart rate. And so technically, I guess you have SIRS, a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Is that real or not? I don't know. You do definitely meet two of those four criteria. Regardless, this is how we define SIRS. The next thing we're going to talk about is how to define uh, sepsis. And so sepsis is basically SIRS plus some sort of infection or infectious syndrome. So again, you could make the argument, what if you have a UTI and an anxiety attack, and so you're tachycardic? and uh, tachypneic. Does that mean you're septic? No, of course not. Uh, I mean, outside of those things. We're talking about a patient who presents, who, who truly has this and doesn't have like an, an obvious reason for it, other than perhaps an infection. Next is septic, or severe sepsis. That's the next thing we'll just, uh, de uh, define. And this is sepsis with some sort of uh, organ dysfunction due to hyperperfusion. So this organ dysfunction might mean that you have decreased urine output, you might have altered mental status, you might be hypotensive, or another marker of, of hypoperfusion, which is you may have an elevated lactate, which would be greater than 4 millimoles per liter. So that defines severe sepsis. Now, septic shock is severe sepsis that uh, has low blood pressure, and this is not responding to a fluid bolus. And you can see that these definitions are all kind of progressing, right, from sepsis to, to SIRS plus infectious being sepsis to septic, sepsis is severe sepsis plus organ dysfunction and down to severe sepsis. Now we have one more definition which is the end here, and that is multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. And obviously, as the name implies, what this means is that multiple organs are not functioning properly. So for pulmonary, these patients would develop uh, ARDS, Acute respiratory distress syndrome, where their lungs fill up with fluid. Renal pain, you would develop acute tubular necrosis. That is, if the kidneys shut down. In the liver, you get like a shock liver. Your bilirubin is going to go up, and your LFTs are going to go up. GI, you'd get an ileus. And the hematologic system would be affected by either like a coagulopathy, anemia, or decreased platelets, which seems to be the, the worst marker. Now, MOD is what kills patients. And where do you suppose that these patients die? In the ER or in the ICU? It's in the ICU where they die. But the cascade of events which starts MODS probably starts in the ER. So our goal in the emergency department is to stop MODS from happening. And so where they don't reach that end point here where they die. And how do we do that? We do that with early goal directed therapy, which we're going to talk about. But the E in early, the, the early, the E in EGTT is, stands for also to start it in the ER. Now let me just mention a few other patients who tend to do really poorly and sometimes will not die in the ICU but even die in the ER. And those are called the crash syndrome patients. And those are patients with meningococcemia, neutropenia, necrotizing fasciitis, asplenic patients with pneumonia, so they are uh, susceptible to all those encapsulated organisms, liver failure patients, and those with MRSA pneumonia. So these patients will die in the ER. 
meaning they take a turn for the worse very quickly. So jump on these patients. And the other important thing is remember to do a skin exam. You got to get these septic patients undressed and look everywhere. So now let's go through a case and see how we would manage one of these patients. So let's say you have a patient who comes in with a chief complaint of fever, and these are the vital signs. Febrile, tachycardic, tachypnic, um, has, has a fever here, and a little bit of a low oxygen saturation. The daughter says that this patient has been coughing for the past week, and the patient herself is somewhat obtunded, and the, fa and the family member says, no, she's normally pretty awake and talkative. Okay, so uh, already we know with, with these vital signs here that this patient meets SERS criteria. With the fever and the cough, we already have sepsis, uh, severe sepsis. We have altered mental status as one of our uh, organ dysfunction things, so we meet that criteria. Septic shock, well, we haven't done anything to know if she responds to a 2-liter bolus yet, so we're not yet sure. And MODS has not yet developed, and we're going to hope to prevent that. So with all our patients, we're going to start with IVO2 monitor. So let's say our patient got hooked up to the monitor. They put an IV in on the patient. And for most septic patients, I'd probably intubate them. Respiration is a very metabolically active uh, process, and so is fighting infection. So if you take away this patient's work of breathing, they can now dedicate all their efforts and all their energies to fighting the infection. So intubate the patient. So now airway is taken care of, breathing is taken care of, and circulation we're about to jump all over too with our early goal-directed therapy. Now another initial action that we should consider is prompt administration of antibiotics. Don't get too hung up on it, just make sure they're broad spectrum and get them in early. Try to draw blood cultures beforehand if you can, but if not, just hang them and draw the blood cultures while you're doing that. Now let's talk about the early goal-directed therapy. And remember that the goal-directed therapy was not shown to be helpful. It did not prevent MODS in the ICU when goal-directed therapy was started in the ICU. But early goal-directed therapy, when started in the ER, it does help. And in fact, uh, of every six patients you treat with this, you're going to save one. So you have a number needed to treat of six. That's a, a great uh, intervention we can do. Okay, so let's start with our intubated patient, sedated and paralyzed because we wanted to take away their work of breathing. So the next thing that we want to do is to make sure that their tank is full. And what does that mean? It means that they have enough volume. And the way you're going to measure that is with their CVP. And you want that to be above 8. So how are you going to measure that? Well, you can either put in a central line or you can use an ultrasound to look at their IVC. Or just give them a crap load of fluid. And I'd probably start with uh, first one bolus and then a second bolus of crystalloid. Two liters. Once you make sure that their tank is full, the next thing you want to do is make sure you get their blood pressure up. And how are you going to measure these things? Well, you can just do this from a blood pressure cup or an A-line. And your tool to achieve this is going to be a presser, a vasopressor. And I would just start with norepinephrine. If norepinephrine doesn't work, then you can add uh, some vasopressin to that as well. Now the vasopressor that most people are familiar with is dopamine, and norepinephrine has, been norepinephrine has been shown to be a little bit superior to dopamine. So start with this. Do not start with vasopressin. Start with norepi, and if norepi alone doesn't cut it, then add vasopressin. Then the next thing you want to make sure is that they have enough oxygen carrying capacity. And the way you're going to measure this is through their uh, mix, uh, central venous oxygen saturation. And our goal is to keep this above 70%. We have two tools to do that. Number one is we can transfuse them. Get their hemoglobin above 9 or 10 so that they have more uh, oxygen carrying capacity. And the next thing you can do also is add uh, an inotrope like dobutamine. Now dobutamine is, don't confuse this with dopamine. Dobutamine is not a vasopressor. It's an inotrope. In fact, it actually lowers your blood pressure, but it causes the heart to pump blood out faster and stronger. And so the, the blood is going to be pumped out. It's going to be carried to your tissues as well. And so hopefully those tissues which are starving for oxygen are not going to need to extract as much out of it as possible because they're getting a good supply. So that'll raise this number here. And then remember that this process just keeps going on and on. And so it doesn't stop you'll likely be continuing to give them fluids and have them on pressors and maybe the dobutamine keeps going. Okay, let's tie this up by uh, talking about a few more concepts. So first let's review our fluid management that we've done for this patient. After we noted that the patient was shocked, we initiated uh, fluid resuscitation with, I with IV fluids, crystalloid. And if that's not sufficient, then we call that uh, fluid-resistant shock. So then we jump to our next intervention, which is pressors. 
And we said that in septic shock, we're going to use norepinephrine and possibly even throw in some vasopressin. Now, if pressors don't work, then we have pressor-resistant shock. So then what do we do? Then we're suspecting maybe there's a little bit of adrenal insufficiency working here. And so you can give some steroids. And then you could give that every uh, six hours. Now, if this doesn't work well, then we're kind of in trouble. Some other important things that we want to do is that we want to use low tidal volumes when we intubate the patient and put them on a ventilator. So we're looking at tidal volumes of like 6 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. Remember, if you're 5 foot 3 and you weigh 125 pounds or you weigh 400 pounds, your lungs are the same size. So it's based on ideal body weight. We don't want to over distend these lungs. We don't want the plateau pressures in there to get too high. And so, in fact, the goal is to keep the plateau pressures presser, pressures less than 30. Then you want to control the glucose. Get it to somewhere less than 180 to 200. We used to stress tight glucose control, but we ended up making people uh, hypoglycemic, and that just made things worse. So, just get the glucose under 200. Also, keep the head of bed uh, around 30 degrees if you can, with the idea here being that we would uh, prevent any aspiration. Also, let's try to keep the urine output more than half a cc per kilogram. So obviously the patient needs a Foley. This also gives us a good indicator for how well the patient is perfused and that the kidneys are still working. And that's per hour, I should say. And it would be great to have some sort of anti-cytokine medication, but drug companies have looked for it and have not been able to find one that works. And so there is no such thing yet. So crossing that out. Don't even look at those words there. And that, my friends, is sepsis in a short video. If you have any questions, put them down there in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.